All right, so this is the most sort of basic introductory lecture that we'll do that's not really heavy on informatics, but it's kind of just to get us all on the same page in terms of transcriptome analysis and the background. Um, this lecture is, I find, uh, the most fun if people interrupt with questions. I'm going to talk through kind of like the molecular biology background to RNA-seq, how RNA-seq data gets generated, some kind of general principles of analysis. So if there are like questions that you've always had that are kind of coming from that sort of general perspective, or you're thinking about designing your experiments, or you're wondering about why your experiment was designed a certain way and not another way, um, please do feel free to um, ask questions along the way. Uh, often your questions are things that other people are wondering about too. And so I find it's really useful to, to talk through some of those things as a group. Okay, so we're going to go through, so this is sort of like a high-level overview of the course. We're going to start with an introduction to RNA sequencing, which is really sort of the, the, the starting materials for doing a transcriptome analysis, which is essentially kind of where you get your data from and the sort of nature and characteristics of that raw data, uh, and then many of the kind of supporting resources and files that are needed to start an RNA-seq analysis, things like reference genomes, transcript, uh, reference transcriptome information, and so forth. We're going to then align, uh, do a QC analysis and align our RNA-seq reads against a reference genome and then do some visualization exercises. Uh, and then we'll go into expression and differential expression and then alignment-free uh, expression estimation and batch correction. So that's kind of like high-level overview of the next three days. <clears throat> uh, and we're essentially going to do that, as Obi mentioned, by walking through some sort of real-world examples. Um, with real data where we go step by step from raw uh, FASTQ files through to uh, abundance estimates and differential expression analysis. And we've tried to make the, so there's an accompanying website that we're going to follow through this, this hands-on tutorial, and we've really tried our best to make that um, be a working example of a real RNA-seq analysis pipeline with a few sort of minor caveats. So all of the commands that you see there should be very much uh, applicable to what you would do with your own data, um, but for the purposes of demonstrating the analysis in this class, the data is um, kind of a, a toy data set or sort of optimized for teaching purposes. So we've deliberately chosen like a very stark comparison, uh, and there's a series of different data sets. One is sort of one we're going to walk you through, and others that you'll kind of do some stuff on your own. Uh, but each of them is, you know, pretty dramatic differences, so that you can really see different the differential expression results producing significant results. With a, with a small data set. So we've really downsampled the data so that when we're doing some of the more computationally expensive steps, like aligning all of our reads against the reference genome, we're not like starting the command and waiting like two hours for it to happen, which for you might be totally reasonable um, to wait a couple hours uh, if it's like the data you're gonna be analyzing for the next year or something. Uh, but in this setting, of course, that wouldn't be practical. practical. Uh, so everything is meant to run in a reasonable amount of time with relatively modest computer resources. So we're going to run everything. Each of you is going to be on your own uh, cloud instance, which is you know a pretty basic machine. It's not like a supercomputer or anything. And the the online material is really meant to be self-contained, self-explanatory, and portable. At least that's what we're aspiring to. So we want it when you go back to your own lab, you're gonna you know be drinking from a fire hose of information for the next three days. You're never gonna capture all of it. The hope is that you'll kind of remember like where to go back and look, and then you can go through at your own time. And there's like a, a kind of a written version of everything that we're gonna say out loud, and hopefully that will kind of like refresh your memory on what we talked about. Uh, and if you find anything that's sort of incomplete or really doesn't make sense, um, kind of just let us know, and because we're always looking to to improve that aspect of the course. Okay, so the first module we're going to briefly go through just the background molecular biology of RNA seq analysis, challenge some challenges that are specific to RNA seq analysis as compared to other kinds of sequencing uh, assays and analysis. Uh, we'll review briefly some of the general goals and themes of RNA-seq analysis workflows, so sort of the general things that you can use RNA-seq for, and the sort of like common patterns for how the analysis works, regardless of which of those themes that you're pursuing. Um, some common technical questions related to RNA-seq analysis that just kind of, they always come up, so we just kind of talk through those. Uh, and then I'll do an introduction to the RNA-seq hands-on tutorial that we're really going to be sort of living and breathing for the next three days. Okay, so just to make sure we're all on the same page here, let's start with 
uh, the central dogma um, where this laser pointer works. Sometimes it crashes this thing, which is kind of lame. Um, all right, this bar is in my way. Okay. There. Is that better? Okay, so most of you, I assume, are starting with a double stranded genomic DNA template in your species. This, um, and we're interested in studying genes, I assume, most of us. This is a very cartoon depiction of a classic gene model uh, with three exons and two introns. Um, for most eukaryotes, these introns would not be to scale. Generally, the introns are very large compared to the exons, although uh, in something like yeast, you might see a gene that looks something like this. Um, the features that we think of as a gene, sort of like basic features, you have a promoter region um, that initiates transcription. Um, you have uh, exons. In one of those exons, you might have a transcription initiation codon, um, and then there will be a trans translation termination codon or stop codon, a polyadenylation sequence if this is a, a, a transcript that's going to get polyadenylated. Um, this thing will get transcribed and polyadenylated in the, in the nucleus. Uh, into single-stranded pre-mRNA molecule, uh, which still has the introns intact, uh, but now we're showing the various regulatory features that instead of uh, regulating transcription, regulate the process of RNA splicing. Uh, so a very complex splicing machinery comes along and recognizes uh, the exons as distinct from the introns, uh, splices the introns out at donor and acceptor sites, uh, assembling the exons together, uh, and a variety of regulatory features like exonic splicing enhancers and silencers and intronic splicing enhancers and silencers help to regulate this process. Uh, once complete, you wind up with a mature mRNA transcript that has been uh, capped and polyadenylated. Uh, it then gets exported to the cytoplasm uh, where translation uh, into protein can happen. Uh, so a protein uh, is, is created by translation, and then there's a, a additional steps of folding, post-translational modification, uh, subcellular localization, uh, and so on that lead to an actual functional product. Um, many of us, I think someone mentioned RNA binding proteins, but probably many of us are interested uh, primarily, or at least uh, in part, in uh, genes that function as a protein. Uh, and if we could just sequence these things somehow, identify them efficiently in a cost-effective manner, determine, so take a bulk sample and like measure all the proteins in it, get an abundance readout, both identity and quantity in a sort of cost-effective way. There's probably quite a few of us that would go down that road um, because there is a, quite a disconnect potentially between what's happening at the transcriptome level and what's happening at the protein level. And if what we're ultimately interested in is primarily the function of proteins, we would probably do that. Um, but it's not really feasible despite decades of relatively uh, um, consistent iterative improvements in proteomics. It still remains like quite challenging to do um, discovery proteomics in a kind of pro proteome-wide fashion that's cost-effective and accurate and doesn't require buckets of cells. Um, there's certainly lots of great things about proteomics, but a lot of people are doing transcriptomics because it gives you this very fast, cost-effective readout for, for relatively, uh, with relatively small input, relatively simple sample workup, cost of a few hundred dollars, you can get this really quite broad measure of what's going on in the transcriptome of uh, a pile of cells. Uh, and that has been an amazingly enabling uh, advance to be able to do that. Um, Another thing that I like to cover on this slide is um, just thinking about what an RNA-seq experiment is doing. So it's not measuring the protein. Of course, we have to keep that in mind. But what is it measuring? Which of these depictions is the closest thing to what that is actually being measured in an RNA-seq, a bulk RNA-seq experiment? Anyone? Yes. Yes, the mature mRNA is the closest. But it's not exactly what we're measuring. What, what's happening in an RNA-seq experiment is a little bit different in a few ways. Anyone want to mention some, some of those ways or one of them? How is it, how is it different, what's happening in an RNA-seq experiment? Yes. Yeah, so it's not full length. Most bulk transcriptomics it works on fragmented uh, molecules. And they're in the range of like two to 400 nucleotides long is kind of like what you would typically see, maybe a little bit longer, maybe shorter, but something like that. So 
in a eukaryote, you know, like say human, the median uh, trans full length transcript size might be several thousand nucleotides long. Um, but the thing we're measuring is approximately an order of magnitude smaller than that. So we're basically, we're measuring pieces. Um, any other sort of technical differences between what's being sequenced in RNA seek experiment compared to mRNA? Yes. Yeah, it's not actually RNA. <laughs> so we have to convert it to cDNA. Um, and that's a step that has to be done. And there are kind of different ways that it can be done. Um, and uh, in the process of, I'll talk a bit about this later, in the process of making that cDNA, there are ways to make your RNA library that encode information about what RNA strand was being uh, expressed. Um, and some approaches do that and some of them don't. Those are kind of the two, the two biggest differences um, between um, sort of what we're thinking about biologically in terms of RNA and what is actually being sequenced. Okay, so this is really like high level cartoon depiction of what um, an RNA sequence experiment looks like. You have some series of samples of interest, um, which you are studying uh, in terms of biological questions. You isolate RNAs, you generate cDNA from that RNA, fragment it, size select it, sometimes add linkers, uh, and those linkers drive sequencing reactions. Uh, and a very common way of doing this is to add linkers to both ends and to sequence from both ends, starting at the outside towards the middle, so that you get a series of fragments that have been sequenced in a paired end fashion, which is depicted here. Sometimes, depending on the size of the fragment and the, the length of sequencing that you're producing, the two reads um, meet in the middle, which is what it's being de depicted here. My laser pointer back on. Other times the fragment is a bit bigger or your reads are shorter and the two reads don't meet each other and you have some unsequenced portion that was of the fragment that remains unknown. Either way, you align these pieces back to the reference genome uh, in a way that takes advantage of that pair information. So it's sort of, uh, if one of the pairs uh, aligns ambiguously, but the other pair only aligns to one place, it can like use that information to figure out where this fragment actually probably came from in terms of the genome. Uh, and then you produce an alignment file that has that sort of raw alignment information, how each of your raw sequence reads relates back to your reference genome. And that alignment information is the subject of many downstream analysis uh, approaches, including expression abundance estimation, differential expression analysis, and much more. So RNA sequencing uh, has some sort of basic fundamental um, challenges driven by the biology of, of RNAs and molecular biology. Um, one is sort of true of most experiments. The, the quality of the sample uh, is important. So it's purity for the thing that you wish to measure. Sometimes you're working with complex cell mixtures and the thing that you're most interested in is not every cell, but it's a subset of cells. So in bulk RNA sequencing, we think a lot about purity. So how pure are the cells for the cell type that I'm most interested in? In cancer, we're thinking a lot about how many of them are tumor cells versus non-tumor cells. Um, quantity. RNA-seq works pretty robustly on small input amounts, but if they're too small, it does become a problem um, and the quality. So of course, RNA is uh, relatively fragile. It's easy for RNA to become degraded. Um, RNA-seq is surprisingly resilient to degraded RNA uh, because the RNA gets fragmented into pieces anyways. Uh, if we were doing some kind of like full length or long read sequencing attempt, we would probably worry more about like having very, very intact RNA. Uh, but you can tolerate quite a lot of uh, intact, uh, lack of intactness in RNA for, for bulk RNA sequencing. Um, one of the main differences between transcriptome analysis and DNA seq analysis is that we're sequencing RNAs, and for eukaryotes, those RNAs correspond to exons that are separated by large introns. The introns are not in our reads, uh, but they are in the reference genome that we're trying to align the reads back to to figure out where each of our uh, fragments came from. So that creates a, a read mapping challenge that's uh, quite a bit more difficult than when you're trying to align uh, DNA reads back to a reference genome you know, where you expect in most cases like a contiguous match across the entire length of the fragment and you don't have to worry about like part of your match getting to the end of an exon and then the remaining part of the match continuing on potentially quite far away. Uh, so that sort of like creates an additional challenge to the, the alignment algorithm. Another issue that's quite particular to RNA uh, analysis is this challenge created by the difference in the relative abundance of RNAs. The, 
the range is really dramatic. Um, so a, a gene can be functional and really biologically important in the cell with just a few copies per cell. Uh, tel telomerase is kind of a famous example of this, like really important enzyme, but the per cell copy number of the transcripts that correspond to that protein is very, very low. Um, whereas other RNAs, in order to do their function, are expressed very, very highly. And they're all mixed together, and we're sequencing with a kind of random shotgun approach. So we get sort of information back that's proportional to the things that are, are proportional to how common they are in the samples, and this creates a sort of sampling problem. So you tend to be able to sequence some things really easily. Certain genes are easy to get a robust readout on to measure the abundance of them, whereas rare transcripts you have to sequence much more deeply uh, to be able to sample them accurately. Uh, and then the other thing that we've talked about a little bit already is that RNAs come in a wide range of sizes. Um, in their sort of functional mature form, you can have RNAs that are very, very small. So microRNAs being one extreme example where they function as very, very short molecules, um, where and other RNAs might be 100,000 nucleotides long or, or even longer. Uh, and this creates a difficulty if you really want to create like a holistic picture of the whole transcriptome. It's hard to have like a wet lab workup that works equally well for really small RNAs and everything else. So there is a little bit of a divide. If you're interested in small RNAs, there's generally like a separate library construction approach for things that are say less than like 100 base nucleotides or so. Uh, and then everything else that's bigger is treated separately. Uh, and then we talked about mature mRNA. So if you're really interested in the, the polyadenylated RNAs that give rise to proteins, um, that's fine. Um, but if you do a poly selection, thinking that you'll enrich for those RNAs, this can sometimes introduce a problem because if you have degradation of your RNAs and you uh, hold on to the three prime end of every RNA, you can lose the five prime R, uh, parts of, of transcripts uh, some sort of systematically. Uh, and then your sort of shotgun view of the transcripts uh, becomes biased towards one end of the transcript as opposed to getting representation across the whole transcript. Uh, and then I already talked about the fragility of RNA compared to DNA. Any questions on like the library construction sort of ways that the samples are processed or anything like that? Comments? So, okay. All right. Yeah, so the question is, um, sorry, you probably all heard that while repeating for the recording. Um, the question is, uh, if you have like a rare cell population, say you've got some T cells mixed in with your cell population and some of those T cells may all have like a different TCR sequence due to unique uh, VDJ recombination events, they could be quite rare because it's a rare cell in your bulk population. Do you miss those? Um, the answer is, it depends. Um, maybe not. Um, there have There is actually a tool from a couple of years ago that's specifically aimed at um, looking for uh, TCR sequences in bulk RNA-seq data. Uh, and if the sequencing of your library is quite deep, you can actually, uh, it turns out do a reasonably good job of sampling the TCR repertoire or BCR repertoire of a, of a sample population just by looking in the bulk RNA-seq data. Um, but it's not the most sensitive way to do that for sure because there, yeah, because you do have this random sampling problem. So if you're really interested in the TCR or BCR repertoire, you'll often do some kind of amplification that really like it sort of enhances the sensitivity for those specific sequences to make sure that you're capturing as many of them as possible. But you can get a pretty decent view of the, the repertoire and its diversity or lack of diversity in your bulk RNA-seq data if it's like a relatively deeply sequenced um, sample uh, just directly from the bulk RNA-seq. And there's a, a tool called Trust4 that's aimed at that specific um, uh, type of analysis. Anything else? Okay. Okay. So we talked a little about about RNA quality. This is uh, so you you have access to all these slides. This is a link to an old slide deck that I created years ago, but it still um, remains true um, that um, this assay um, 
that involves running RNA uh, through a capillary gel electrophoresis uh, machine is a pretty common way to assess the quality and intactness of RNA and also give you a quantification. Uh, so the concept is you, you run your RNA through uh, a capillary um, and the smallest RNAs come through first and the biggest RNAs take more time and you read off the abundance of RNAs at each of the different sizes and the readout of that uh, is um, created uh, creates this electrophorogram uh, readout where a high peak means that there was a lot of RNA at that particular size and a small peak means there's less of it. Um, and in human, if you have really intact total RNA, um, what you mostly see is the two ribosomal RNA species at expected sizes. So you can look for these two peaks. Uh, and because we anticipate that 90, 98, 99% of the transcripts correspond to these ribosomal RNAs, in total RNA. If our RNA isn't degraded, we should basically just see two big peaks, and we can measure the area under the curve of those two peaks to calculate a score for how intact the RNA is. Uh, this is commonly called an RNA integrity score, uh, which is on a 0 to 10 scale, where 10 is sort of perfectly intact RNA, and lower numbers are varying degrees of de degraded RNA. Here's an example of a sample. I think I isolated this from like a bulk uh, colon tumor sample. Uh, that was, you know, quite degraded. So you can still see the two ribosomal peaks, but you also see all of these smaller peaks that are essentially represent the RNAs being broken into smaller pieces. If you ran this on a gel, it would appear as a smear instead of two distinct bands. And this works out in this case to an RNA integrity score of six. And this slide uh, slide deck that I provide a link to has a whole bunch of examples of these electrophorograms from samples that were isolated from different kinds of sources where we expect uh, more or less degraded RNA. In terms of making your RNA-seq data, like this would probably be totally fine. Um, we routinely uh, create RNA-seq libraries from uh, with written scores that are like into the four or five, maybe even three some, something range, although it gets harder as, the, as it gets more degraded. Uh, this is kind of a reference slide. So there's the uh, ONCODE Consortium published this really great standards, guidelines, and best practices for RNA-seq during the earlier days of RNA-seq really become widely used. And they provide all kinds of sort of general guidance on uh, sort of how you should design your experiment, the kinds of metadata you should collect, kinds of control experiments, sequencing depth, reporting standards, and so on. Um, it's one of several uh, sort of large consortium efforts that sort of went through this formal process of like deciding like how do we what is a good RNA seq experiment look like so it's sort of provided for your uh, review if you're at the stage of designing a new series of RNA seq experiments it's worth taking a glance through um, it has a lot it covers a lot of really important concepts there are a lot of different library construction strategies I would say like compared to other um, sequencing modalities um, uh, for DNA or even epigenom epigenomics, things maybe have become a little bit more standardized. I would say that RNA-seq remains like surprisingly unstandardized in the way the data is generated. Um, there's still a mix of libraries, library approaches where people are using total RNA, uh, others are using poly-A RNA. If you're using total RNA, generally there's a riboreduction step to remove the bulk of the ribosomal RNA so you can actually sequence uh, other RNA species. Um, there are different ways that groups do size selection. Um, for low inputs, there are some uh, labs that will offer like a linear amplification approach. There's still quite a mix of uh, library kits that result in stranded uh, RNA-seq information and others that uh, result in unstranded information. If it is stranded, the stranded information can be one way or the other way. Uh, it's annoyingly unstandardized. <laughs> Um, and there's quite a few uh, different strategies for library normalization that attempt to deal with this problem, that there are some things that are really, really common and some things that are really, really rare. And that creates like a problem when you're generating the data that if you're interested in something that's rare, it can mean you have to produce a huge amount of data to get down to those rare things. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of variability here. And really, from an analysis perspective, the main thing to keep in mind is that you're if you're aggregating data from across time or from multiple labs, or if things have changed you know, in your core, or you switch from one core to another core, you really can't count on uh, the data being generated in a consistent fashion. So you'll have to like keep this in mind or try to control for it. 
Um, and that's one of the reasons why we include a batch correction module at the end of this course, because it's fairly common that you wind up trying to combine data that was generated in different ways. Does anyone have any questions about this aspect of sort of like how you interact with your core, what kind of data they're producing, um, what kind of libraries you're working with? Okay, so this is like an, an overview of what the workflow looks like to generate the data. You start with some tissue, you isolate total RNA. Generally, there's an assessment of RNA quality. Uh, used to be people would run it on a gel. I think that's relatively uncommon now. Uh, more common is to, to calculate some kind of score. Uh, and, a, and a popular strategy is to use this uh, gel electrophoresis, a capillary electrophoresis approach that I described. So here's a depiction of sort of three libraries of, or four libraries of varying degrees of degradation from really intact to totally, totally degraded with a RIN score of only two. Um, assuming that you decide that your RNA is of sufficient quantity and quality to proceed, you will almost always do a DNA's treatment to remove genomic DNA contamination, um, some kind of RNA fragmentation, cDNA synthesis, uh, and then some kind of size selection or exclusion um, to get uh, molecules that are in, uh, at least remove the small things maybe. Um, and then you'll add sequencing adapters uh, to each end of all of your fragments uh, and send that uh, now cDNA libra fragment library off to sequencing on an Illumina, usually Illumina sequencing instrument. Is anyone using data that doesn't come from the Illumina platform, some other sequencing platform? Yes. Uh, like gene expression microarray data. Oh, okay, wow. Yeah, okay. So some of the like stuff we're going to cover would be sort of, you know, equip or uh, applicable to um, uh, microarray expression data, uh, but quite a lot of it is sequence specific. Okay, so um, I mentioned here that there's uh, or somewhere in here, that, uh, yeah, here there's an in, usually an enrichment step of some kind. Um, there are kind of three different popular enrichment strategies, all of them trying to deal with the, the issue of getting rid of the huge abundance of ribosomal RNAs so that you can sequence uh, everything else. So if you just tried to sequence total RNA, you would just get huge pileups of sequences aligning to ribosomal uh, transcripts, which would not be very interesting. Uh, so generally, you're doing one or a combination of these three uh, enrichment approaches all of which most commonly work through a hybridization uh, capture approach. So you have some probes that recognize sequences and use those to enrich your library for the transcripts that you care about. Uh, probably the most common is ribosomal RNA reduction. So you just buy a kit, someone has designed for your species, oligos that match the ribosomal genes of your species. Those grab onto all the ribosomal RNAs, and then you hold onto those and wash through everything else, and that enriches for non-ribosomal RNA species. You can also do the positive selection that I mentioned, uh, holding onto the poly A tail of each transcript and washing everything through, and then eluding off of the column to get your enriched. Uh, and then you can do a cDNA capture where you actually use an exome reagent, uh, which is oligos for all of the known exons of your species and you hybridize your library to that, essentially sort of directly selecting for transcripts that look like genes that we already know the sequence of. Um, and sometimes that will be combined with uh, one of these other approaches. Uh, and we have found that this can be a good strategy for RNAs that are particularly low quality. So for example, um, tumor samples that come from um, FFPE blocks, we will often subject those to the cDNA capture approach. I mentioned the stranded versus unstranded libraries. We're going to visualize this. Uh, so basically, the, the premise here is that uh, in a lot of RNA-seq um, data production strategies, when you get your reads back, you align them to the reference genome. If a read aligns sort of entirely within an exon, um, you don't actually formally know whether it came from, it was actually that known exon transcribed in the expected direction, or if it's actually antisense. Uh, expression. And if you're studying a, a, a less well-known species where you don't even know if there's a gene there or not, you might not really know which, which strand was being transcribed. Um, unless the RNA spans across uh, exon intron boundaries, then you can use the known structure of the donor and acceptor sites of splicing to pretty like powerfully infer which strand was most likely being expressed. Um, 
but there are library construction uh, approaches that retain that strand information so that later on you can basically get the encoded in the, the read itself uh, and the way it aligns to the reference. You can sort of know which transcript was being transcribed and that sort of gives you sort of another way, layer of specificity when you're aligning to the reference genome and you're trying to figure out how to count known genes and transcripts. You can limit your counting to the ones where the, um, the strand matches expectation. So just a few sort of common questions. Sometimes people ask about replicates um, in RNA sequencing on today's platforms. Technical replicates are really not needed. So you don't need to worry about things like, was my data produced on different flow cells of the instrument or uh, on different days of the week or in different lanes of a flow cell? The sequencing platforms become so robust and reproducible that that's not really a concern. But of course, you need, you need biological uh, replicates um, just like uh, in any experiment. Uh, I think we're finally past the days where people would do like an RNA-seq experiment and just have like an N of one versus one and have like no statistical power to compare anything. We do have some like example workflows, I think in the course that would will still work in a kind of crude way for that kind of analysis. Um, but generally you want replicates. Um, some common analysis goals of RNA-seq data um, so gene expression and differential expression is really what we're going to focus on. That's by far the most popular. You get this functional readout of what is going on in your cells. can be very useful for studying an incredible diversity of biological questions. Uh, but RNA-seq is also really a fantastic way to study alternative expression, alternative splicing, alternative polyadenylation or transcript start site usage. Um, it can be used for transcript discovery in a species that you don't know what all the genes are. Um, Inferring genes from the genome sequence used to be like a whole subfield of bioinformatics that's basically gone away now because it's so effective to just sequence the transcript. I'm going to line it back to a reference genome and see kind of more directly what the transcript and gene structures are. Um, allele specific expression uh, can be done very effectively with RNA seq data. You can discover mutations directly in RNA seq data. It's a little bit tricky, but it can be done. Um, gene fusion detection, RNA editing, and so on. All of these kinds of analysis follow a certain like uh, pattern to them. So um, they will generally have a step where you obtain raw sequence data, um, align or assemble the reads of the raw sequence data to a, a reference genome or assemble them against each other. Uh, and then you get an alignment file or an assembly file that you process uh, with a tool specific to each of your goals. So there might be one tool that gets expression abundance estimates, another tool that detects fusions, another tool that um, does differential expression analysis or looks for RNA editing and so forth. Uh, but they all kind of follow this pattern. Uh, and then that tool will inevitably produce some kind of very bespoke, poorly documented, complicated output that you will then import into uh, downstream software for visualizations uh, and uh, statistics and to really sort of start to ask the biological questions of your experiment and uh, create uh, visuals um, and results for uh, publication or design of other downstream experiments. This is a kind of depiction of some example RNA-seq uh, workflows. Um, so all starting with FASTQ, there's several passes paths depicted here where you go through this phase of either alignment and assembly and then quantification, normalization, and modeling. Um, we're going to demonstrate several of these tools. Um, so we're going to go through this path on the left where we use a tool called HiSat for alignment, HTSeq for uh, uh, quantification or counting, and then uh, we use both EdgeR and DEseq2 for differential expression analysis in this course. Um, we're also going to go through an alternate path uh, that uses string tie, uh, which gives you a more of an attempt to actually infer what the full length structure of transcripts is from the, these short fragments, uh, and then use a tool that uh, goes along with that called ball gown for differential expression. Uh, and then we're also going to demonstrate at the end an, a, a reference free approach where if you didn't have a reference genome at all, but you have reference transcript sequences, you can directly compare your reads against those reference transcripts uh, in a very computationally efficient way. Uh, and Callisto and Salmon are really popular tools um, for that approach. Uh, we're going to demonstrate Callisto, but the, the concept is really uh, cross-applicable. Okay, so I thought, so a number of you mentioned that you were interested in bulk 
RNA-seq or single cell RNA-seq or both. So I thought it would be useful uh, to end this lecture with a brief discussion of some of the differences between bulk and single cell. Uh, and then we're gonna ask you guys to talk about what you think some of the differences are. So um, what are some of the sort of technical and high level differences between doing a bulk RNA-seq experiment, which is what we're gonna do here and doing a single cell RNA sequencing experiment? Anyone want to toss out any thoughts or ideas? What's the obvious one? Cheaper. Cheaper. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. That. Yeah. So, which one's cheaper? Bulk. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so bulk is probably. Oh, geez. Maybe it's like one tenth the cost. I would say to get like a pretty solid. If you just want to do differential expression analysis, like get a like a rough abundance of each transcript and compare across a number of samples. And if you're particularly if you're sampling a lot of samples, so you're really like sampling the diversity of our population, or you're collecting samples from many, many like locations or time points, or um, it get really, really expensive to do that kind of experiment with single cell, but actually fairly cost effective with bulk RNA seq. So yes, cost is a big one. I mean, what else? What other kinds of differences? Yeah, there might be a sorting step. And I would say just generally speaking, the, the sample workup is usually more complicated on the single cell side. The uh, A lot of bulk RNA seq experiments have really like kind of simple, so if you, you have cells that you isolated from somewhere and you, you know, maybe they're being cultured, maybe you're like comparing some ex like perturbation conditions, or maybe you're sampling them from uh, the wild or whatever it is you're doing, uh, but you kind of go from sort of having those cells to sort of uh, making a total RNA from them kind of like as quickly as possible. And it's relatively like straightforward workflow from there. Most people are just taking that total RNA and delivering it to a core and having them make an RNA library. So you go from kind of like bulk tissue to nucleic acid to data sort of like with relatively like limited manipulation or like opportunities for sort of bias or other like uh, sort of variation to be introduced. Whereas in single cell, in part because of the cost or because you really are interested in a rare population and it sort of defeats the purpose of your single cell to like do single cell, but then you know, only 3% of your cells are the cells you actually care about. It's pretty common to have some kind of like sorting or enrichment strategy uh, tacked on. And even if you don't, there's probably still some kind of like live dead sorting or some kind of special uh, storage considerations or you're like, you know, running to the operating room at like five in the morning to like get the sample so you can process it like fresh for single cell. It's sort of just harder to work with the samples generally in single cell. And what else? Anything else? Right. Yeah. So it's right in the name. Uh, yes. Yeah, so you you get single cell data with the single cell approach, and you don't with bulk RNA seq. It's and it can be quite difficult to if you have a very complex um, mixture of different cell types in your bulk sample to really kind of understand what is happening in those different cell types because the signal is all just mixed together in one big pile. And there's a whole branch of bioinformatics, a sub branch uh, that uh, has for years been de developing deconvolution approaches. That's really aimed at that idea, trying to like like it, make some assumptions about what it would look like if I had a mixture of these three different types of cells together and to try to like uh, untangle them from the bulk signal. But it's a really, really hard problem. Um, so that's really the main like appeal of single cell analysis is now we're actually getting a readout from individual cells. Um, anything else about like the samples or yes? Yeah, exactly. So the depth of sequencing and the number of genes you can pick up um, in a bulk transcriptome experiment for $500 or $1,000, you can get a very comprehensive view of the transcriptome, tens of thousands. You can sample essentially every transcript there relatively robustly, um, like 20,000 transcripts detected in a, in a bulk RNA-seq experiment wouldn't be unusual at all. Um, whereas in single cell, it's more like what, how many, how many transcripts are we seeing in each cell? 
yeah, like a thousand or something. So that's a pretty big difference. So, and which that, which thousand, what, why is it that 1000 and not a different 1000, which are the ones we're actually detecting? Yeah, the most abundant ones, exactly. So, but we talked a bit about how even like bulk RNA sequencing has this problem that most abundant genes are easier to like measure and the rarer ones are harder. Uh, you can compensate for that by just sort of brute force producing more data and the data is relatively cheap to produce. So you can do that pretty effectively. Um, in single cell, you can't really do that. So you can't, you can't really brute force it. First of all, it would be very expensive. Um, but secondly, the information just isn't there. Um, so it's amazing that it works at all, um, that we're able to like sequence transcripts from individual cells, but the data that you get back is really, really, really sparse. So um, the amount of sequencing that you're doing on your, in your single cell experiment is probably already mostly exhausting the information that's in the library and just producing more sequence data from those cells often won't give you that much more information. You're just, you're only able to capture so many molecules from an individual cell and you tend to be capturing molecules from genes that are relatively abundant. So really rare things um, are just gonna be really hard to assay. Uh, and there are a variety of like strategies that people use with single cell to get around that, including like site seek, uh, which sort of layers on like a, an antibody like measuring uh, approach on top of your single cell data to, for genes that are really important or care about a lot, but that doesn't scale to thousands of genes or even hundreds of genes. Any other differences? Yes. Yeah, so you're referring to kind of the sparseness or the, yeah, so the sparseness of data, is, is there, is that kind of a biological limit or could it improve in the future? There are definitely people trying to improve it. The molecules are there. So the cell was an intact cell. Um, so there, I assume that there like is some potential to like improve the molecular biology and just sort of capture more of the like complete component of cells that were in an individual cell on a droplet that winds up making a single cell library, but I think it's technically hard. And this is molecular biology that, you know, we've been working on for decades. I, like, I guess I'm somewhat like skeptical that like a big advance is like right around the corner that all of a sudden we'll be able to just like capture every molecule that's there. Uh, I think, you know, maybe one way you could think about, yeah, maybe like some of the like nanopore type sequencing approaches that don't maybe are really sensitive and don't rely on amplification or something you could imagine. But I think it's going to remain remain difficult. And the way that I think the way that the more practical way to overcome this problem is to sequence more cells. So where you have more cells that are of a type that you're interested in. So say you're interested in you know CD4 helper T cells or something, and in your condition they're only like five percent, and you're only in each of those cells you're only getting like a thousand or two thousand transcripts detected. If you could just like up that to like you know instead of a few hundred of those cells, they've got tens of thousands of them, you would start to be able to kind of fill in the gaps just by going like sort of borrowing like information across cells instead of relying on what you can get from a single cell. But that again gets really expensive. There is some like biological limit as well, though, right? You talked about transcripts like turn. It could just be that there are actually just magic changes to copies of the RNA that are too dangerous in us at a single cell level. Yeah. In which case, like the true count might be one. And then you have to think of it as low count, but that there's a lot of uncertainty in the expression as to the making conclusions about differences between cells or groups of cells can be more challenging to measure the differences between cells. There, there are both like technical and biological limitations to the two cells. From a fundamental kind of analysis like perspective when you're thinking about the data i would like encourage you to think about like we don't usually look at the data visually like the actual numbers um and this is particularly true in single cell there's a because the data sets are so large there's a little bit of a black box thing that happens that just like you process it through cell ranger and then downstream stuff happens with these like really amazing tools um, and so it's easy to forget that the matrix of like counts, the actual values that represent your real information is incredibly sparse. It's like, it's mostly zeros. And when it's not zero, it's mostly one. And sometimes there's a two or three or four, like think of it like that, like, and so that's quite qualitatively different from an RNA, bulk RNA-seq experiment where there's very, relatively few zeros, actually, almost everything has some measure if it's a real gene 
or again, contrasting even going back further to like the microarray days where it's impossible to have a zero because you had like an analog readout and there was just always some noise. So zero was like some variable number that's down here low. And then there was always a number for every other gene. And that changes the kinds of analysis you do, the kinds of statistics that make sense. Um, and just, it's just good to keep in mind in terms of like how much uncertain, how much skepticism should I have <laughs> about a particular observation? Something that we haven't talked about yet is the, the um, what part of the molecules, the RNA molecules are actually being assayed in bulk versus transcriptome. So we talked about how in, in bulk, you kind of get pieces, fragments, but those fragments come from any part of the, the transcript. And so if you have enough of them, you can kind of get a sense of like, maybe you can piece together what the, the whole transcript looked like. Or if you're interested in measuring an exon that's in the middle of like a 20 exon transcript, you might actually be able to do that. What What's the deal with single cell? So like that, someone know? It's not like that. <laughs> um, it's very unbiased by design. Uh, so that's sort of another like limitation of the way the molecular biology works is that the, the single cell approaches that are popular right now, they really are measuring transcripts at either the three prime end or the five prime end. Um, and you get sequences that go a little bit into the body of the transcript, but not very far. So. They're much less useful for alternative splicing analysis or for detecting a mutation that you're wondering if it's expressed, unless it's right at the end of the transcript. You really like measuring the ends of transcripts and using that as a proxy for sort of how abundant that transcript is. Yes. Yeah, so the, the question was what alluding to the the emergence of some like probe-based single cell, like the I think so this technology is being used in like the spatial transcriptomics, like cosmic platform um from uh nano string, I guess. Is that the one you're referring to? Right, so they, and they target certain sequences and you have to like choose from a sort of a, a library of target sequences. Yeah, so I think that is an, like a way to try to work around that, but then you, the trade-off is that it becomes more of like uh, information-driven design where you have to sort of choose up front what, what you're interested in and there's like a non-infinite number of things you can target in each run, so you kind of have to make choices. Um, but yeah, there's, yes, there, there are definitely workarounds to that aspect, yes. Why would you not just do a paired end, like to get both the five prime and the three prime end of the gene? I think there is some technical difficulty that makes that hard. I think the, maybe, I think, so in part, I think the, the sensitivity issue with getting RNA molecules from a single cell is such that it basically involves amplification right away. And that amplification is driven from like a primer at three prime, and um or four or five prime end um and then those are the fragments you get so you do often well it's actually not common to sequence both ends of those fragments so the fragments are are end biased so even if you sequence the whole fragment it's still like a chunk at the end of the transcript um there is a little bit of variability as to how those things do get sequenced and so our center for example sequences from both ends um, even though from one end, it's sort of like not as useful information uh, because of all of the like, um, I guess like adapter sequences that you have to sequence through to get to the actual biological sequence. Um, but the advantage is that you can then put those libraries like and have them sequenced alongside like every other kind of sequencing that's happening at your center. Um, but it's fairly common to just sequence one end of the single cell library. It really does, the three prime it doesn't work well at all. So. But like it's still stuck mostly on the five. Yeah, I don't 
it seems like there should be a way to have an amplification strategy that's less end based, but that doesn't seem to be that. Yeah, it seems like it's technically challenging because it hasn't really emerged. And this is like, so we've encountered this problem where we're interested in like measuring specific sequence alleles that are not, don't happen to be right at the end of the transcript. And there's like quite a like, um, there's a, a bunch of labs working on like ways to overcome that limitation technically that like by using long read sequencing or coming up with amplification or like capture approaches is that feed into the single cell like work up, but it's quite technically challenging. Any other comments or questions on this? Yes. And I have two conditions and I sequence all the RNA from particular gene from every condition, but I still have a lot of variability in those conditions. Like some are C and some no. In the same condition. Can I compare it to them or how do I manage that kind of yeah, no. Yes, the question is essentially like you have two conditions of interest. Um, so maybe you're, it was like sick versus healthy, say. Um, but within each condition, you have a lot of biological variability. Um, this is like a common uh, sort of very basic problem in biology. Um, I don't know that there's a, an, a good answer other than trying to control your variability if you can, sometimes not possible. If it's not possible, I think just more sampling is really the thing you can do, I think, to like to have increased statistical power by sampling more deeply is sort of like the, the most robust answer, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so we'll talk a bit about this in the um, batch effect section, uh, which leans on a very comprehensive um, batch effect analysis that actually uh, explicitly tried to ask the question of what, what do we what happens when RNA quality is systematically different? Um, I think um, if there's a way to correct for batch effects introduced, like if the, the poor quality RNA is somewhat sporadic, like you sometimes have bad quality RNA and sometimes it's better and it's happening somewhat like equally between your two conditions of interest, then you can definitely like do batch correction to compensate for that. Um, but the I think the problem that happens in some biological systems is that the the poor quality is coming from one of the conditions and not the other. And it's a nature of the condition that creates a like sample quality issue somehow. Like, um, and that is, that's difficult to, um, to correct for. Um, I think the best you can do is just to like, keep in mind that that may be a source of differences that you're seeing. And to some degree, you may be able to compensate by increasing sampling size. Um, though if the, difference is really quite systematic. It could still be there no matter how much you sample potentially. So it's just like a really hard problem. Um, I think I have occasionally heard of people in that situation artificially trying to make their good quality data look more like the bad quality data. That's like one strategy you could contemplate. Thank you. Yes. You can sort out your accelerator as there's is there really a deviation in the single cell? Like if you sort out your pure population, is it always better to do bulk sequencing in that case? See so the question is if possible, yeah, if it's then, possible to like sort yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, if it's possible and practical to sort your cell of interest, then the question is like, would you ever do single cell analysis? Why not just do bulk? I think that the short answer is, yeah, just do bulk because you get this much more robust readout of the transcriptome for quite a bit cheaper. Um, and if you already have the cells you care about, you'll just be able to ask more kinds of questions of that data than you will of the single cell data. And you've already kind of like removed the element of needing to see what's happening in single cells by purifying your cell population of interest. Um, I guess like the flip side of the argument would be like 
people that worry that their like enrichment is introducing some kind of like bias or that's not giving you the whole picture or you want to understand the like interaction between cells in the more complex environment so you do single cell to kind of get a, a, a more holistic picture of the the heterogeneity of cell types that are interoperating with each other and you do the um this sorting and sequencing to really uh, like define that specific population. Uh, so I think that could be a situation where doing both makes sense. I think there are many like situations where doing some of both makes sense. Different parts of the cell cycle, yeah. yeah. So like there's still there's still heterogeneity there that would potentially be mature at the bulk level that you could potentially get past the single cell cycle. You could certainly take those cells that you've purified though and subject them to a single cell and ask like how how much heterogeneity is actually there still after the sorting and compare that to your bulk and ask kind of like what what does the analysis look like on the bulk versus the single cell data for these sorted cells. That's like a very interesting kind of experiment to do. Great. Good. Okay. That was great. Lots of good questions. Very interesting stuff. Um, this is another reference slide points to um, a paper uh, that we published quite a while ago, but it's still, you know, a lot of these like um, questions um, and resources are just sort of fundamentally relevant to bioinformatics analysis and transcriptome interpretation. So that's just sort of there for your uh, reference later. Uh, and now we'll transition to introduction to module one. So we're going to move into the hands-on stuff. We're going to start working through uh, the course tutorial site. Um, and this is a crude depiction of sort of the, the path that we're going to work through um, starting. Uh, so most of today is really going to be uh, dealing with this box at the bottom here. So we're going to talk a lot about the sort of fundamental inputs to transcriptome analysis. So starting with our raw sequence data, we're going to do a QC analysis. We're going to talk about reference genome sequences, uh, uh, formats of the reference genome, indexing reference genomes. We're going to talk about uh, transcriptome annotation uh, file formats and indexing transcripts. Um, and then once we've gathered all of our inputs, we're going to uh, feed them through a read alignment algorithm that is a splice aware read aligner. Uh, and then a couple competing approaches to transcript compilation and uh, expression abundance estimation, and then a couple sort of paired uh, versions of the differential expression analysis that take the those counts and start to compare between conditions. Uh, and then we're going to do quite a lot of um, visualization, interpretation, pathway analysis of the res uh, gene results that come out, comparison between the different sort of pipelines of analyzing the data, how much do they agree with each other, how different are they, uh, and quite a few elements of quality control uh, experimentation uh, using just both sort of fundamental data QC approaches, but also um, using a, a spike-in approach that is uh, commonly used in the uh, sequence data production course. Uh, 